Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. How many of you have been to Old Faithful? Pictured here on the screen. You've been to Old Faithful? A few of you have been there. We've been there. Pastor? Yes, sir? Junior church. Doc was unfaithful to dismiss junior church. Thank you for the illustration of faithfulness. It's something else to see old faithful, and it reminds us that faithfulness is a most important quality for us as believers. It's a character quality for us to to cultivate in our hearts. We have such faithful people here. Thank you for that. But we're talking about faithfulness today, and and I want you to know that it's on a different level than we often think of faithfulness. There are some things that perhaps you cannot do. Maybe you can't play the piano or come up here and sing a special. Maybe you can't teach a Sunday school class as your teacher did this morning or stand up and preach. But there is something that you can do. It's something that we all can do. We can be faithful. And we're talking about faithfulness to God, which again is bigger than how we usually define faithfulness. Um, As we talk about faithfulness right now, please allow me to shock you As I say right now, oh, come and be faithful. But let me shock you in saying that faithfulness to attend church is the least of what faithfulness truly is. Oftentimes when we talk about faithfulness, we talk about our church attendance. And you're here. Thank you for that. (laughs) Um, But faithfulness is bigger than that because you can be faithful to church every single service and not be a faithful Christian to God. True faithfulness happens every day of the week and in a multitude of ways. In our text of Acts 20, the Apostle Paul, uh, we find him on his last lap, his third missionary journey, and in chapter 20, he's, uh, he's about to head for Jerusalem from Ephesus where he has spent uh, several years at this point, three years. And he has to say goodbye to some dear saints that he's very close to in Ephesus. It's a very tender and touching scene we're about to examine. Uh, one of the most heartwarming farewell speeches that you'd ever hear anywhere Uh, in literature, and he literally opens up his heart and lets us peer inside and see what's in there. And so the first attribute that we see is faithfulness. Look at verse 18. You're in Acts 20. Verse 18, he says, And when they were come to him, he's about to say goodbye, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you, at all seasons. Um, From the first day when he hit the ground running through many hardships in a very difficult city, a tough, tough ministry for the Apostle Paul, he was dependable from the first day and he never quit and he never slacked off. And did you see at the end of verse 18? It says, at all seasons, at all seasons, no matter what happened, He wanted to be characterized by faithfulness, and I believe he was. Jot it down, please, on your handout today. Faithfulness is a quality which I admire, but it's a quality which God requires. Requires. 1 Corinthians 4.2 is on the screen where it says, It is required in stewards that a man be found, say it with me, church, faithful. It's required. Here's some areas that we need to be faithful. We need to be faithful to our family. Our family. Faithfulness begins at home. Let me say that again. Faithfulness begins at home. 
God's first institution. You remember the 96 presidential election, it was Clinton versus Dole, and the cry of the day was, you know, in regards to what Clinton did, uh, that it doesn't matter. A candidate's private life has nothing to do with how they run the country. And of course, we've learned that that kind of thinking is nonsense because it has everything to do with it. If a man can't be trusted with his marriage vows, what's he gonna do with those piddly little vows of the public trust? I mean, those are way down here compared to your marriage vows. And so uh, if you're not faithful at home, you're not faithful anywhere. It's at the very core of our lives. Let me add today that you don't have to be physically, sexually unfaithful to your spouse to be unfaithful to your spouse. You can be unfaithful simply with your eyes in your TV viewing and what you look at on your computer or your phone. You can be unfaithful. Uh, some are married to their jobs and unfaithful to their spouse. Some have a love affair with shopping or with sports and are unfaithful to their spouse. True faithfulness is something that's before God who sees everything that we do and not just the way that we tend to define this. Have you ever slept with someone besides your spouse? Uh, it's so much bigger than that, isn't it? Now, Ephesians 5.25 says for us to love our wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. There's the picture of real faithfulness is actual sacrifice, giving yourself for someone that you love. Jesus is the epitome of true faithfulness. He demonstrated it to us, and he demonstrated it through sacrifice. Now think about that. If I can say I love you to my wife through flowers, I'll do that. If I can do it through candy, I'll do that. But you know what she's really looking for is my lifestyle, my actions, my attitude, and what I'm willing to sacrifice for her. There's really nothing so precious that we should not be willing to sacrifice it. That is, give it up for our spouse. Now I'm going to leave preaching and go to Medlin right now and say no bass boat, no hunting equipment, no job, <laughs> no golf outing should be so precious. And Paul, of course, was a golfer. You remember he said, I have finished my course. This goes for the ladies, too. No friend should come before your spouse. No co-worker should know secrets that you won't tell the person that God joined you to and took two and made into one. That person should know more than anybody else on the planet. Our children should not hold higher loyalty than our spouse. Faithfulness begins at home or it doesn't begin at all. And so there's the family to consider there's our finances to consider. Faithfulness in our finances. What would you do with a million dollars? Hmm, let me think about that. What would I do? One guy said, I'd put it toward my debts as far as it'd go. <laughs> Listen, I know the answer to that question. I know exactly what you would do with a million dollars. You'd do the same thing that you're doing with the hundred dollars that you have right now. That's what you would do. In other words, if we don't put God first and tithe now, we wouldn't tithe if we had a million dollars. If you're not generous now, you certainly wouldn't become generous if you were rich. If you were not faithful in your finances now, you wouldn't be then. If you don't believe that, Luke 16.10 on the screen, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful in that which is much. God says, if I can't trust you with a little then you're teaching me a lesson here. Don't give them a lot. I can't trust you with a little, so I can't trust you with a lot. So you'll never have a lot is the lesson he takes from that. You heard about the guy who said to his wife, honey, I'm pretty sure that our kids got their brains from me. She said, I'm sure they did, because after all, it's the little things that count. <laughs> 
Luke 16, 10 is on the screen. The very next verse, verse 11 says, If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, that's a King James word for money, if you've not been faithful in that, who will commit to your trust the true riches? True riches are things like wisdom, power and understanding, knowing God's will and advancing. God says, the test of your faithfulness in the spiritual realm is what you do with your finances in the physical realm. Remember, it was Jesus who said, where your treasure is, is where your heart is. Now, many today, therefore, are deprived of some blessings, frankly, because they're not faithful with money. And again, it's bigger than just the tithe. Let's not just think of it as the 10%. That's a no-brainer. How about the other 90% that he entrusts to us to keep and to use wisely, to save and prepare? Some people don't get their prayers answered because they're not faithful with their finances. Some don't understand their Bible and lack wisdom because they're unfaithful in their finances. Some are powerless in their witness and never win any souls to Christ because they're not faithful financially. These are all things that we can draw out of these verses. If we don't pass this simple physical test, God says you're really not going to go anywhere spiritually until you pass the simple test of ownership. And again, it's bigger than money. The money isn't the real issue. The money is just a test that God uses. So make sure and pass that test. When you pass a test, you know what God, the teacher, can do? Start sticking gold stars and smiley faces all over the paper of your life. Because you passed the test. I need wisdom. I cannot afford to be foolish with a lack of faithfulness to my family, in finances. Number three, to the fellowship. To the fellowship. We're here as a part of the fellowship this morning. And now I briefly talk about church attendance, which I just said is the least of what faithfulness truly is. I can say this for a simple reason. Because if you are truly faithful to God, it is a no-brainer that we will be faithful to the church, the body for which he died. He loved the church so much that he died for it. And the Bible has so much to say about faithfulness to church it's a blessing to see you here today, but my question is, will we be seeing you again soon? Romans 12.5 says we're one body in Christ, members one of another. This is the body of Christ we're talking about here. You're a part of me. I'm a part of you. We're a part of each other as much as this arm is a part of my body. And when the body meets and you're not there, part of the body is missing, can't fully function, we need each other. Hebrews 10, the 25th verse, says not to forsake the assembly together, that there always will be some, the manner of some is. And so much the more in the last days, as you see that end approaching. That's us, folks. Have you ever heard of someone say, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian? That's true. But I doubt the sincerity of the salvation of anyone who knowingly, willfully forsakes the assembly when it's in their power to be there. Oh, I get just as much out of nature. And as they say it, they reveal the heart of their problem. Did you hear that statement? I get as much out of nature. They reveal the real heart of the problem. You don't come for what you can get, but for what you can give. Matthew 20, 28, Jesus, our example of true faithfulness, he came not to be ministered unto what he could get, but what he could give. How many boys and girls can you teach about Jesus at that lake? <laughs> what missionaries can you support and write to in those woods? Whose babies can you watch out at the theme park? Now, we just quoted Hebrews 10.25. It said exhorting, which means encouraging. It's an encouragement. You enjoy church better, I've seen it, when there's a good crowd than when it's half empty. And you're wondering, where's the rest of my body? We are a body. And I can tell you folks, 
about 10 different sermons or so that have been absolutely life-changing to me over the decades. And they all had one thing in common. I was present <laughs> for each and every one of those. And I'm so glad that I was. We can also take advantage of technology if we've got to work or be out in the nursery or whatever. Only eternity will tell what God intended to do in some of our lives who just willfully miss. So if we're faithful, let's remember that God is faithful. He has messengers for us, teachers and preachers that he will use to ding, ring our bell. If only we will follow the basic command to be faithful. And when you do that, you're saying to God, you're important to me. You're saying, Pastor, you're important to me, the work you put into this. You're saying to your fellow body parts all around you, you're important to me. Faithful to our fi family and finances, to this fellowship. Number four, to the faith. To the faith. I'm talking now about the Word of God. Hold your Bible up for me today, would you please? Faithful to the faith. Thank you. Many today are doubting parts of this Word. Doubting the Word of God. Approaching the Word of God cafeteria style. Taking the parts they like and leaving parts that they don't like. Uh, we're putting question marks where we should be putting exclamation points behind the facts that our Bible teaches us. Now, some who doubt the word today even call themselves theologians. That's a lot of the ones that are doubting it, are people who call themselves theologians. Look at the screen. This word comes from two Greek words uh, on the screen here. Theos, which means God, and the word logos in the Greek, which means word. They call themselves a theologian. Look at this. They don't believe the logos, so I tell you today, they don't know the theos. And they're not a theologian then. It's like grape nuts. They're not grapes, they're not nuts. Okay? Well, maybe they are nuts. Folks, we are not to judge the Word of God. We're supposed to let the Word of God judge us. And so we must be faithful to the faith. And if I'm the last one standing, God help me to be faithful to this. When all around me say, you guys are still saying that about homosexuality? Nobody's saying that anymore. You need to say, somebody is still saying that. My God's saying that, and I believe it. Amen. The first thing we see when we peer into the heart of the Apostle Paul is faithfulness. Quickly, number two, we see humility. Humility. Look in the very next verse, verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. Stop right there. Paul was known for his humble nature and his humility. In spite of all his greatness, Paul was a humble man. Perhaps the greatest Christian to ever walk the earth and yet so humble, and that's part of what made him great. <laughs> I remember the story of D.L. Moody saying he was working on his humility. He was a humble man. And going out on the streets of Chicago, wearing a sandwich board around his neck that said, I am a fool for Christ's sake. That's a Bible verse. He just wanted to be more humble by wearing that. But then he later laughed and recounted, I went home and told my wife, I don't know any other man who'd do what I did today. <laughs> Doesn't sound like humility, does it? Sounds more like pride. We don't really see that from Paul. We see that over and over again from Peter. God didn't give up on Peter. He worked on him about this. Uh, he was humble in the end. But we see Paul all the way, a humble man. You know, you don't hear Paul say, did you know I wrote half the New Testament? Even though he did, 
I'm talking about Romans and Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians, Thessalonians and Timothy and Titus and maybe Hebrews. <laughs> no, he said, 1 Corinthians 15, 9, I am the least of the apostles. I'm not meet, I'm not fit, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. Ephesians 3.8, I'm less than the least of all saints. 1 Timothy 1.15, sinners, he said, of whom I am chief. I'm the chief sinner. Now that's real humility. Humility means that we recognize that without him we are nothing. Humility, real humility, means that we are aware that we are unworthy. You understand that apart from Christ, you're nothing. And that it's not in talents. It's about the touch of God. Paul had a touch of God on him. And part of that was that humility that he had. And that faithfulness that he had. You know, thinking of this humility of the Apostle Paul, it's so easy for us to get overblown in our own mind when God does something great in our midst. It's so easy when God blesses us to develop an overinflated opinion of ourselves. And you know what we're doing? We're glorying. We're glorying in that. We're basking in that glory. But God is the one who deserves all the glory. We are unworthy. I heard about a flea who hitched a ride on the back of an elephant. They crossed a wooden bridge. They got to the other side and the flea whispered in the elephant's ear, did you feel her move when we walked across? <laughs> we? <laughs> Humility is tough to cultivate in our lives, especially when God does some great things in our midst. If you don't like the flea, think about that woodpecker working on a tree, pecking away at that tree, then it got struck by lightning, the tree did. The lightning obliterated the tree into a smoking, splintery mess, and that woodpecker flew away in shock. But he came back after a few minutes with five other woodpeckers, and he said, there it is, boys, right over there. <laughs> yeah, isn't that the way we are when God does something great and we're even nearby in the vicinity? No, he that hath done great things, glory to his name. He that is mighty. Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, ye are the branches. It's the Holy Spirit who does the work. He, if he does a good work through us, is really doing it in spite of us. It's for his glory. Now, of course, we should work hard. Of course, we should use every tool at our disposal. We should work like it all depends on us. But through it all, we must pray like it all depends on God. I invite you to come out and join me in praying again for revival right in this room at 530, Brother Robert's classroom at 530. Seven men joined me this past week. You come out and join me. Ladies, come and join me. And if you're in the choir, then you all have a special prayer time in your practice as well. Let's pray like it all depends on God. We see faithfulness, we see humility, and we see compassion in the Apostle Paul. When we peer inside of his heart during this tearful goodbye, the tears are a language. It's a language that God understands. They say a picture's worth a thousand words. If that's true, then your tears are worth a million words that our hearts can't even get out. Groanings which cannot be uttered, and God understands that language. Verse 19 he said, with many tears. Look at it again. After he says, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, he says, and with many tears. Some think it's not manly to cry. Well, Paul was a man's man. He was no weak-minded basket case. He wasn't some crybaby. He was bold as a lion, beaten on several occasions, tortured for the name of Jesus Christ, Imprisoned, maligned, and stoned, but he never backed up, he never backed down, he never gave up, he never gave in. He was a tough cookie, and in spite of all his toughness, all his tenacity, he had a heart of compassion. Look down in verse 31. 
Verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with what? Tears. Tears. Three things made the Apostle Paul cry, and then we're done. Look at verse 37. They all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more, and they accompanied him unto the ship. What a tearful goodbye. And three things we see making Paul cry. Number one, he wept at the very thought of backslidden Christians. Christians who weren't living for the Lord, but who were living in sin. 2 Corinthians 2.4 on the screen says, Out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears. What book of the Bible is this from again on the screen? What is it? 2 Corinthians, right? What was he talking about? He was talking about his first letter, 1 Corinthians. Have you ever read 1 Corinthians? It was a scathing rebuke. <laughs> I mean, he rebuked their cliques and their schisms, how they played favorites in the church, taking each other to court, their sexual immorality, abusing spiritual gifts and not obeying rules regarding tongues and such. But he didn't write it mad. Now we know his tears stained every page because he wept at the very thought of backslidden Christians. Now when's the last time that you actually wept over your sin and your own backslidden condition? When's the last time you wept over an erring Christian, an erring believer, rather than just running to someone and gossiping about them or feeling superior to them? When's the last time you went with tears to someone who was away from God and begged them to get right with God? When's the last time that you apologized to someone out of sincerity and brokenness? Paul wept at those thoughts. Number two, he wept at the thought of the threat of false teachers. False teachers leading away his flock. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Look at verse 31. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone. What was he warning them about? False teachers. Back up two verses. And we'll see what he was really crying about. Verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. You know, it should break our heart any time we lose someone from our fellowship, especially when they end up going somewhere that's not so founded on the Bible. Or God forbid, they're out of church entirely. Paul wept at those thoughts. He wept at the very thought of people going to hell. That's our third and final point. People going to hell. Romans 9, starting in verse 2, he said, I have great heaviness, continual sorrow. Here's what I weep about, verse 3, that I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, that I could go to hell for my brethren, the Jews, my kinsmen according to the flesh. What a powerful statement that is. He wanted people to be saved so badly that he'd be willing to go to hell. And you and I are not asked to go to hell for anyone, to be baptized for them or anything like that. Rather, we are asked to pray for them and to weep for them. And that's what we're not doing anymore. If you think about it, how could we not weep at the thought of someone burning in a Christless hell for all eternity? Compassion makes a difference, Jude 22 tells us. Compassion. Psalm 126 says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, here it is, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves, that's fruit, with him. I like what we see here as Paul says goodbye to these dear believers in Ephesus faithfulness. And we're reminded that anyone can be faithful. All of us can be faithful. When we see humility and compassion in his heart, we realize these are choices that we can make as well. No special talents necessary. 
The only qualification is willingness to let God do spiritual surgery on our hearts and mold us and shape us into his image. What am I saying? Revive us. We're talking about revival. And revival starts in my heart, in your heart, with these basic character qualities we study today. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for this poignant challenge that Paul gives to us in just opening his heart and showing how he felt toward you, Lord, and toward the believers in the church. Thank you for the privilege that we can be a part of the very same church. Help us, we who like Ephesus in later years who may have lost our first love, to get back to that compassion. Lord, abase us as needed with the humility so we can really see you work in power. We know that you resist our pride and you won't bless it, but you choose to lift up the humble. May we be those humble, caring, compassionate believers. May we serve you with the kind of faithfulness that's bigger than just a list of do's and don'ts. That's even bigger than our fellowship or our finances. The kind of faithfulness, Lord, that starts at home, that starts in our own closet where no one is looking, but you can see. Faithfulness to obey you when you tell us to turn it off, to turn the channel, to get off that website, to get off our duff, to get out and serve you with our life and with the strength and the energy that you've given to us. Help us to be faithful to share your words, to stand for the faith by sharing it with others. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord, we believe. Help thou our unbelief. Grow us. Strengthen us. Empower us. Lord, on behalf of this, one of your dear churches, I say today, revive us again. And we pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Still in a spirit of prayer, as the music begins to play now, let's stand to our feet. If you'd like to use this altar and pray today, the thief on the cross wished he could. He couldn't put his hands together. He could not get on his knees. But he, in his heart, bowed before the Lord beside him and said, Lord, I believe. Remember me. That's humility, too. Bowing before our Lord.
thank you very much. No birthdays or anniversaries we're aware of today. Confess if we're missing you. Church is a good place to confess. All right. Um, listen, revival is for the most faithful among us. That's where God's really going to do it. We talked about it on a Sunday morning last week. But tonight, join me. We're going to talk about the actual highway to revival. And we're talking about it now at night because that's who God's